anybody old enough besides uh, me and Adam to remember, uh, sorry, to remember Spirit, right? 1960, you know, late 60s California rock band with um, Randy California, I think was the guitar player, and his father-in-law or stepfather, Cassidy, was the ball drummer. It was very, anyway, very hip band back then. So apparently, unbeknownst to me, and apparently most other people, they had a song in the late 60s, and they, by the way, they opened for Led Zeppelin. That's Taurus. That's Stairway to Heaven. Anyway, you can find this on YouTube. Just, just uh, go to YouTube and do a search for Taurus versus Stairway to Heaven. Um, I can tell you from my untrained ear, there is quite a bit of similarity. But it's 45 years later or so. What the heck is, is uh, the estate of Randy California who has passed away? I guess he was the writer of Taurus. What are they doing 45 years later suing Led Zeppelin? Latches? Well, I think in light of the Petrella case, they're in pretty good shape. And this is going to be another interesting one of these, did they or didn't they infringe? And if Led Zeppelin is found to have infringed with Stairway to Heaven, even though uh, the estate of Randy California can only go back three years, I guarantee you, uh, Led, uh, Stairway to Heaven is still getting a lot of airplay and that album is still selling a lot of albums. There's a lot of money at stake in this case. So this is what plaintiffs, Little Richard, etc., are going to have to be thinking about, Ike, whatever, Ike's estate, are going to have to be thinking about do they have any claims for copyright infringement even though they might originally have arisen 20, 30, 40 years ago, are they going to be able to now, do they have new life because of the, the Raging Bull case? In the music arena, everybody familiar with last year's big hit, moving on a little bit, last year's big hit, Blurred Lines, Robin Thicke, and the controversy with Marvin Gaye's estate, got to give it up, Robin Thicke. Spliced them together. Somebody spliced them together for YouTube. Marvin Gaye. By the way, this is fair use. Everybody got the picture? Well, that's, ex that's exactly what happened. Robin Thicke did something. Robin Thicke and his co-writers, they were getting demand letters, angry demand letters from the estate of Marvin Gaye's lawyers. And so what the, what the Thicke lawyers did was they went and filed a deck relief action. Judge? We're getting all these. We're getting all these threats. We want. We don't want to be in the position of a defendant. We don't want to sit around and wait for them to sue us. We're going to file a declaratory relief action. We want a judgment that they we didn't infringe. That was filed a year ago, uh, and it was filed in August of last year. I just checked the DACA today, so it's almost a year later. The case goes on. They're just starting discovery now, or at least now, the motions to compel yeah. further answers to whatever, interrogatories, requests for production of documents, etc. Those motions were just filed with the court uh, in LA this month. So it looks like this case is in for a long 
Hall. And I think I read, I didn't have a chance to find it uh, in the docket today, but I think I read online in one of the so uh, so sources I found about the, the, the ongoing dispute that the gay estate filed a counterclaim for copyright infringement, which is natural. Mm -hmm. So uh, this thing is going to go on, and of course, once again, there's millions of dollars at stake. Now, how many, how many uh, musicians do we have in the room who can read music? Okay, half dozen. You tell me. Okay, remember, okay, my operating theory is every blues shuffle sounds alike. Every three-quarter time country and western song sounds alike. So in copyright infringement, it's not enough that the public thinks they sound alike. The test is substantial similarity. That's a very loose test. Um, now, but in music, the court is going to, I think, filter out the common elements that you can find in other songs. So if somebody sues, if, if songwriter A or recording artist A sues recording artist B or songwriter B for copying a blues shuffle, I think the court's going to filter out the blues shuffle, the beat, and the time signature, and the same thing with a country and western song, that's essentially a waltz, right, in three-quarter time. M the melody lines sound very different, yeah. according to Michael. I think this is going to be a battle of the musicologists. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sir? My question is, I mean, if Robin Thicke's pretty young, in these types of cases, do they have to prove that the artist that's getting accused of copying it had exposure to that song. Well, they don't have to prove it, but if they if the plaintiff can prove access, it increases a, the likelihood of a finding of copyright infringement. If the plaintiff can show access, that's going to help quite a bit. And in this case, I think, Robin Thicke, by the way, I think, has been quoted as saying he was paying homage to Marvin Gaye. That's true. That's what he said. Exactly. So I don't think access is going to be an issue. Now, where access was an issue, again, going back a few years, back in the early 60s, there was a girl group called the Chiffons, uh, a girl vocal group, female vocal group. He's so fine. Oh, yeah, got to make him mine. Oh, yeah, sooner or later. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's about 1962, 1963, very popular, AM, big hit on radio. Fast forward to about 1970, 1971, the Beatles break up, break our hearts, end of the world, Beatles break up, and Beatle George comes out with a triple album, the first Beatle to release a solo work called All Things Must Pass. And the first hit off of that was a song called My Sweet Lord. Um, anybody, anybody can do a chorus from My Sweet Lord for us? No. Anyway, the words were completely different, but the melody was accused of being the same. Went through a lot of litigation, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what the, the judge ultimately found was copyright infringement, substantial similarity, and even though in the judge's opinion, Beatle George did not consciously attempt to infringe, he's so fine he subconsciously infringed. Because in copyright law, there is, you're not required to have a finding of malicious or willful intent for there to be a, for a, to there to be a base copyright infringement. If you can prove maliciousness, if you can prove willfulness, you can get enhanced damages, but it's not a prerequisite to liability. So because According to the judge, Beatle George was guilty of unconscious copying. It was copyright infringement. Now, I think to this day, if you lined up a hundred copyright lawyers and a hundred musicologists and asked them, does My Sweet Lord by George Harrison infringe He's So Fine by the Chiffons, I bet you'd get almost a 50-50 split. There, it's still a source of great debate. I recommend that you go home tonight and you, again, YouTube, look for My Sweet Lord versus He's So Fine or He's So Fine versus My Sweet Lord, and you'll find somebody who's mashed them together. I think it's worth talking for a moment uh, about the Aereo decision that came down this week. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Has anybody read the decision? What's your name? Terry. Okay. 
So Terry's read the Supreme Court decision. Another one I recommend, you can, if you Google AERIO, A-E-R-E-O, Supreme Court, I'm sure you'll find the opinion. Uh, basically, AERIO started by uh, a consortium headed by Barry Diller, who's been a television and film mogul for 20, 30, 40 years. AERIO um, sells or rents, I'm not sure which, little tiny antennas to their customers. I think they said the size of a dime. That's like more like a quarter or a half dollar, but a small antenna that allows the customer to pick up over-the-air broadcasting signals. And Aereo does not pay re retransmission fees to the broadcast networks. The broadcast networks went bananas, as you might imagine. They sue Aereo and um, uh, claiming copyright infringement for failure to pay the retransmission fees. Aereo had a lot of very clever defenses. Uh, goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled this week, sorry, copyright infringement. Now, what happens when the U.S. Supreme Court says you're guilty of copyright infringement? Mm -hmm. Does that mean your business shuts down the next day? Or does Barry Diller and his crew, do they negotiate a deal with ABC, NBC, and bring them in as partners? I think the jury is still out on what's going to happen, but I won't be surprised if they end up in business together because that's what makes the most sense. Because guess what? Aereo has figured out something that the public wants. Sure. And if the public wants it, they're going to get it. And somebody's going to give it to them, and sooner or later, the law better figure it out. Terry, what's your take on the Supreme Court decision? I'm curious. My take is that it's a poorly written mess. Um, it, <laughs> It's not a good sign when they start off the opinion with, well, we don't really understand the technology. Oh, right. Um, right, right. And when, you know, a lot of it is based on the reasoning in Cablevision, they don't mention Cablevision until 28 pages in until the latest dissent, and very briefly. So they really redefine a lot of things that didn't need to be redefined. And so it sounds like maybe it was a results-oriented decision. Yes. They just didn't like what Aereo was doing and then figured out how to back into it. And they're the Supremes, so they get to do that. Yeah, and they tried. They really, uh, they really tried to narrow it at the end. And basically, their reasoning for, oh, this won't affect cloud computing because we say this should. That's be right. Cloud computing. That's right. That was one of Aereo's big defenses. Was if you find against us, court, you're going to be putting an end to all this other technology, cloud computing, etc. Yeah. And the court said, you know what, this decision is limited to these facts. So don't worry about that. <laughs> but that just means there's another case coming, right? But what does this say? How many law students do we have in the room? OK, we got a few law students. Any lawyers been practicing less than five years? All right, so we, and we have a bunch of lawyers practicing less than five years. You guys are at the cutting edge of what I think is the next 10, 20, 30 years of fascinating legal decisions and business cases that are going to be brought. I think we are in, legally, we are in what amounts to the black and white six inch TV stage of technology and the law. I'm jealous of you guys who are just starting out. I wish I had another 20 or 30 years to go because what's going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years is going to be mind boggling. My prediction, Google is going to cut a deal with the United States government, and every child at birth will get a Google chip in their right earlobe. <laughs> you heard it here first. Well, recently, there is a lot of talk about patent troll and podcasting. Right. And what's, I think there is uh, something that didn't happen recently. Is, I forget. There's, there, there's been some legislation. The, the question was, what about patent trolls? as opposed to copyright trolls. So patent trolls are, in, in rough terms, are uh, individuals or companies that own an issued patent, one or more issued patents, and are primarily in the business of suing or threatening to sue people for infringing their patent. And that's their business model. They're also known as NPEs, meaning non-practicing entities. So as opposed to Samsung or Qualcomm 
or somebody who actually owns a patent or IBM or what Fujitsu, they own patents and they actually practice them. They make the products or they license the products. The so-called patent trolls or non-practicing entities, they are not, they don't sell anything. Their business model is to sue or threaten to sue. And it's a big business model and it's being done all over the country and just like the copyright trolling scheme that I mentioned earlier, it's basically designed to use the threat and power of the legal system to get people to pay a thousand bucks here, 25 bucks there, 5,000 here, so forth and so on, using the threat of being brought into federal court for, copy, for patent infringement and have to hire a lawyer to defend yourself. This is very controversial. In fact, it's, in my opinion, or it, it, my observation, it's more controversial na nationwide than the porn copyright trolling cases because nobody, no judge or, I shouldn't say no judge, there aren't that many judges or bar associations or nonprofits that want to touch defending people accused of downloading punk rock orgy in the woods. But they will gather together uh, legislators as well to band together to try to stop the non-practicing entities. And there's been some legislation proposed to really put a crimp in the style of the non-practicing entities. I haven't kept up lately on exactly what the latest and the greatest is, but I think that would be a great topic for another session would be what's going on, what's the latest and the greatest with the effort to try to curb or put an end to patent trolls and non-practicing entities because in my humble opinion, and I'm not alone in this, they are kind of a plague on society and a plague on the legal system. I mean, I, I, I draw a, a distinction between somebody who's in the business of creating products and commercializing them and exploiting them and somebody who's in the business of just using the legal system to extract money out of people. Having said that, there's nothing in the patent law right now that says that's illegal. There's nothing in the, in the patent system that says you have to practice your patent. It's perfectly legal to not practice your patent but enforce it yeah. under the current status of the law. It's just that it's being pushed so far now that it seems like it has a very extortionate, extortionist, extortionate overtone to it. So this is again what happens when we as lawyers push the boundaries of the law, which is what we're either born to do or taught to do in law school. Right? Haven't we all been told? In trademarks, it's use it or, you, or lose it. That's right. In trademarks, it's use it or lose it. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, one thing that makes these patent troll cases so crazy is that they're taking things as simple as you have a uh, checkout cart system yes, that's right. on your website and saying, oh, you have a way to add items to a cart on your website, therefore you're infringing my patent. It's, it's then, extrapolating from the claims of the patent so far that it seems like it goes beyond the logic of what was in the patent at the time it was issued. Yeah. Same thing with the, the podcasting lawsuits. So there's a, there's a guy or a company out there who got some kind of patent, I'm going to say 10, 20, well, maybe 15 years ago, because if it was 20 years ago, it would have expired by now. Some years ago, he got a patent on like distributing information by audio cassettes and uh, business information by audio cassettes and um, CDs or CD-ROMs. And he claims that podcasting is the logical extension of his claim for the distribution method using audio cassettes and CDs or CD-ROMs and he's sending out threatening letters and getting people to pay because who wants to defend themselves in federal court? And it's, a, it's, it's, it's very frightening when you get one of these cease and desist letters. It pertains sort of on the next evolution of the copyright trolling model and that's Rights Corp. Are you familiar with them? I am not. Tell me about Rights Corp. Uh, so Rights Corp is a publicly funded company that is hired out by major corporations to enforce their copyrights. Okay. They're sending demand letters threatening to sue. They are signed by a lawyer, but he doesn't sign them as a lawyer. If that, he, he signs them as a CEO, but I not see. in his attorney capacity. Right. It's okay. a weird line. He's CEO of Rights Corp. Yes. 
So, but they've also gone on the record of saying, well, the whole goal of Rights Corp is to get people to settle out of court. We're not going to sue anyone. Okay. So I'm well, curious what you... Well, I think there's a, there's a problem there. What gives them the right to sue? Because if all they have, if all they've done is entered into a contract with the copyright holder mm -hmm. to sue and they don't have an assignment of the copyright rights, there was a decision a year or two ago, I believe in Nevada, Right Haven, right Haven case. I wouldn't be surprised if Right Corp is some, it sounds like it's, a, it's a, the next generation of Right Haven, and the court found that Right Haven did not have the right to sue and therefore they were thrown out of court and in fact I believe some of the defendants got a judgment against Right Haven which used a very similar business model and has now taken over Right Haven's website and so forth and so on. So I am, I, I don't know enough about Rights, Right Corp or Rights Corp. Corp to be able to speak articulately about their business model but look there are a lot, there are more lawyers out there than there are legitimate clients who are willing to pay for them. So that's going to create all these new business models where clever lawyers are going to look for loopholes to and use the legal system to push the envelope of the law. And frankly, um, it's an unsettled question whether this is always extortion or just proactive lawyering. And I think it's something that has to be examined on a case-by-case -case basis. And you, you can't make a, a generalized statement that just because people sue for copyright infringement, they're trolls. Mm -hmm. um, you have to look at the business model and you have to look at what, what, whether or not they are um, uh, uh, really abusing the legal system. You know, one of my complaints in the old porn trolling cases where the plaintiff would file a lawsuit against 10, 20, 100, 500, 1,000 troll, 1,000 targets at the same time and pay only one $350 filing fee. That to me just, just rang out as an abuse of the legal system. Because if they had to pay $350 for each defendant, they wouldn't use this business model. The fact that they could get into court and get all these subpoenas and start sending out thousands and thousands and thousands of letters and start getting people to go to their website every day and cha-ching, $3,500, $3,500, $3,500. That to me, it was clearly a case of misusing the legal system. Now, the new plaintiffs who are filing the cases one at a time and paying 350 bucks a, a, a crack, that to me seems a little more fair. They're at least paying some part of the freight.